infinite and unexplored, the greatest challenge man has ever faced, an environment alien to man, yet an environment in which man soon will travel. Before man can travel safely in space, however, science and engineering must measure the hazards man will face in the space environment, must develop the protective devices he will need to survive amid hazards to which he is unaccustomed. Hazards like collision of his spacecraft with bits of cosmic metal and rock, meteoroids and micrometeoroids, some large, many small, most of them no larger than a grain of sand or a speck of dust, but they hurtle through space faster than bullets. A meteoroid trapped by the Earth's atmosphere plunges to Earth in flames from atmospheric friction. The heat, even from a particle the size of a grain of sand, causes the air around it to glow leaving a fiery trail in the sky. Children call the fiery trail a shooting star, but science calls it a meteor. These are meteorites, meteors which were not completely consumed in flames during their passage through the atmosphere. A few large meteorites strike the Earth, but most are so small they must be studied with a microscope. Micrometeorites, the cosmic dust of space. Its frequency and distribution unmeasured. Its origin uncertain. Its interest to science enormous. Its hazard to future space travel almost inevitable. Man will necessarily travel in space in pressurized space vehicles that provide him with an artificial atmosphere to breathe and temperature and pressure conditions simulating the conditions on Earth. Puncture of his spacecraft by collision with meteoroids would be extremely dangerous. What sort of metal will he have to use for his space vehicles? Will the problem be puncture, or will it be erosion of his spaceship by micrometeoritic particles, by this space dust? This is NASA's Langley Research Center at Langley Field, Virginia where scientists of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration are seeking the answers to these and many other baffling questions. And this is Mr. Charles Diatola, manager of research project S-55. Project S-55 is an Earth satellite. It has four basic objectives. The first is the determination by direct measurement of the micrometeoroid penetration hazard in structural skin materials. Second, the determination of the frequency of occurrence of micrometeoroids in space. Third, the determination of data regarding the erosion of spacecraft materials. And fourth, the determination of data useful in the design of silicon solar cells for spacecraft power supplies. The satellite was designed and built as a cooperative project by NASA personnel at Langley Field, Virginia, the Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, and the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, as well as the offices of Advanced Research and Space Flight Programs in Washington. The satellite is about 76 inches long and 24 inches in diameter. It was designed and built around the Scout four-stage rocket motor. The satellite is one of the first orbital payloads of the Scout launching vehicle. This is a half-size model of the satellite S-55. It contains five experiments designed to supply direct engineering data concerning the penetrating capabilities of micrometeoroids when they strike structural materials of various types and thicknesses. Penetration data will be obtained here, here, and here as well as in the nose cone. Counting devices located in the nose cone as well as under this experiment will be used to count meteoritic impacts. These data will add considerably to the scientific knowledge of the meteoritic environment. 
The primary sensors developed at Langley consist of 160 beryllium copper pressurized cells, ranging from one thousandth to five thousandths of an inch thick. Puncture of the cell by a micrometeoroid in space will send a message into the telemetry system. Mounted on the satellite immediately behind these cells are 60 foil gauge detectors. Developed by the Lewis Research Center, each detector is a printed circuit mounted under triangular shaped skin samples made of stainless steel. Two thicknesses of stainless steel are being tested for their ability to withstand micrometeoritic impacts. Some of the samples are three thousandths of an inch thick, others are six thousandths of an inch thick. Penetration of the skin sample will break the circuit of the detector, sending a message into the telemetry system. Behind this experiment, 46 special wire grid devices will be mounted. They were developed at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Each detector consists of a thin copper wire wound around a plastic card. The impact of a micrometeoroid particle will break the wire and add another message to the data in the telemetry storage system. Penetration data will also be recorded by two cadmium sulfide cells developed by Goddard. The exposed surfaces consist of evaporated aluminum on a sheet of thin plastic. Micrometeoroids penetrating the exposed surface will allow light to fall on a light sensitive chemical cell inside, sending a message into the data storage system. On the nose cone, sounding boards, which work somewhat like a microphone, will count each impact of a space particle. Four stages of binary counters will add up to a total of 4,096 impacts. Then, after the satellite is interrogated, they automatically reset to zero and start counting again. Acoustical counters are also located inside the pressure cells. Solar cells will convert sunlight into electrical power to keep the satellite's batteries charged. Since the satellite must operate for a minimum of a year, provision had to be made for recharging the batteries in space. Construction of Satellite 55 began in 1958. Basic responsibility for Project S-55 was proposed by Langley. Reams of mathematical calculations go into the design of every component, every system, of every space probe, every scientific investigation. Nothing is left to chance. Intensive heating studies of the payload, projections of the satellite heat absorption and heat dissipation characteristics in space were made mathematically. In Langley's fabrication and materials processing shops, manufacture of the pressurized cells, the primary satellite experiment, began. Langley's Instrument Research Division designed the complex electronics and instrumentation systems. It was necessary to reduce the complex circuitry designs to wafers, then to a finished telemeter module one half the size of the wafer. The ultra-miniaturized electronics of the S-55 draw only one-tenth of a watt, less than a pen-type flashlight. Each of the collecting circuits and the batteries are encased in plastic for protection from moisture and vibration. circuit was individually tested. Then all were assembled and tested for composite operation under conditions simulating the space environment. The command receiver which will receive the radio commands from Earth. 
the nickel-cadmium batteries, which will be recharged by the sunlight in space. The transmitter, which will turn on and transmit the telemetry data in one minute when the satellite is commanded by the radio signal from Earth. The data storage module, the microphone amplifier, the subcarrier oscillator, the encoder, and the summing circuit. Studies had shown the pressurized cells, the nose cone and telemeter containers of Satellite 55 would have to be treated to bring heat characteristics within tolerance limits. A private firm, Swedlow Incorporated, contracted to gold plate the telemeter containers and the nose cone. The pressurized cells were treated at the Army Engineering Research and Development Laboratories at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. At the Lewis Research Center at Goddard and at Langley, the micrometeoroid detection systems were performance tested under vacuum and temperature conditions simulating the space environment. Spin tests simulated the forces to which the satellite components would be subjected during the first few days in space. Shock and vibration tests were conducted to ascertain that all systems and subsystems would perform perfectly under the severe shock and vibration conditions during rocket motor ignition and rocket burning. Centrifuge tests simulated the stress of rapid acceleration during the ascent into space. The satellite components were made to withstand stresses 50% greater than those to be encountered in space flight. The pressurized cans were life tested under extreme temperature conditions. Then, tested in a pressure chamber. The cells are pressurized to eight pounds per square inch over atmospheric pressure at sea level to ensure proper operation. Each can was tested and retested for leaks. There must be no loss of pressure until the can is punctured by a meteoritic impact. Otherwise, the information telemetered back to Earth would be inaccurate. The pressure switches that will record punctures of the cans in space were installed. The switch points were adjusted and checked for proper operation. The acoustical sounding boards were calibrated. The impact detectors were adjusted separately, calibrated to recognize three different momentum levels. A prototype of the payload was built and subjected to severe testing before assembly of the actual flight package. The prototype was vibration tested spin tested, whirled on a centrifuge, and heat tested. The performance of all payload systems working together was carefully observed. Like the rest of the sub-assemblies, test values were 50% greater than those expected in actual flight. January 1961, months of design, construction, and testing moved toward a climax. Assembly of the actual flight package began with the mating of the rocket motor to the spin skirt and payload supports. The satellite began to take shape. The Langley pressurized cell detectors were installed.
the foil gauges arrived from the Lewis Research Center. Followed by the wire grid detectors from the Goddard Space Flight Center. A cover is then placed around the experiments for protection during further assembly operations. All operating components were connected into the telemetry system. And the nose cone was installed. The completed flight package was then composite tested, all systems operating together for the first time. Thermal vacuum tests proved all experiments were operating perfectly under conditions simulating those in space. The payload was drop tested and subjected to other rigorous environmental tests. Satellite 55 was almost ready to go. Engineers examine the records to see that S-55 has held up under test and is satisfactory for the flight. The payload arrived at NASA's Wallops Island Space Station, where it was to undergo final pre-flight preparations and testing. A live fourth stage motor was substituted for the dummy motor around which the satellite had been assembled, and S-55 was taken into the explosion-proof spin room, where it was subjected to dynamic balancing. A heat shield was installed over the payload to protect it from the heat generated by friction during its high-speed ascent through the atmosphere. Months of study, design, construction and testing neared a climax. The S-55 moved to the launch pad for mating with the Scout rocket booster that would take it into orbit. A final checkout showed that the satellite's electronics are working properly and S-55 is ready to go. Before the actual satellite launching could take place, it was necessary to balance out several factors in order to determine the actual time of launch. The time of launch for satellite S-55 was quite critical. As the satellite moves about the Earth, it gets quite hot when in full sunlight and quite cold when in the shadow of the Earth. First, we had to consider telemeter temperatures that had to be maintained within definite temperature limits. Not too hot, not too cold. Second, the ratio of the number of hours in sunlight to the number of hours in darkness had to be determined since the batteries must be properly charged by sunlight. Third, battery temperatures throughout the orbital path had to be determined since the operation of the batteries is affected by the temperature. Another consideration is what is referred to as the look angle of the satellite with, with respect to its position to the sun. If the satellite were injected into orbit like this, the heat would be intense here where the full effect of the sun was received and considerably less here, where the sun does not strike directly. 
In other words, the temperatures would be unequal on various parts of the satellite. By making the satellite spin, the temperatures would be more evenly distributed. That is, all surfaces would be equally exposed to the sun's heat. Solid propellant rocket motors on the Scout 4 stage will spin the satellite at injection into orbit. For the first 10 days or so in orbit, the satellite will gradually undergo a transition from a spinning mode to a tumbling mode and remain in the tumbling mode for the rest of its useful life. The satellite was designed for the correct thermal balance in the tumbling mode since it will be spending the majority of its useful life in that condition. But since the satellite will spin rather than tumble during the first 10 days or so of orbit, it had to be launched at a date and time to provide the best possible ratio of the number of hours in sunlight to the number of hours in darkness during the spinning phase. Orbital launch projections for the S-55 involved all of these factors. Detailed mathematical calculations were checked and rechecked. Finally, the date and hour of launch were determined, and the shot was scheduled. The scientists and engineers who designed and built the S-55 supervised final preparations. Twelve hours before launch time, launch personnel took their stations in the blockhouse to begin the countdown. At NASA's Blossom Point, Maryland tracking station, where the experiment telemetry from the S-55 will be recorded, personnel went on the alert. Near the end of the lengthy countdown, the rocket position is adjusted for the flight. In the Wallops blockhouse, the automatic programmer is started. plus 74 seconds, the second stage ignites and the burned out first stage is jettisoned. The second stage burns out and the rocket with its payload coasts. At T plus 135 seconds, the third stage ignites and the payload heat shield is jettisoned. At T plus 175 seconds, third stage burnout. The rocket orients itself to the proper attitude for injection into orbit. At T plus 483 seconds, small spin motors on the fourth stage spin up the payload, then fourth stage ignition. At T plus 525 seconds, the fourth stage burns out and the S-55 is injected into orbit. Altitude 245 nautical miles, speed about 18,000 miles an hour. Thirteen minutes after launch approaching the African coast, Satellite 55 is on its own in space to begin doing its job of adding to science's knowledge of the micrometeorite hazards. Recording and storing up information on the punctures of the pressurized cells. The foil gauges. The wire grid detectors. Data on penetration of the cadmium sulfide detectors on the nose cone. Information on the Earth's meteoritic environment. First-hand information. 
obtained by counts of the impacts on the crystal sounding boards on the nose cone and inside each of the pressurized cells. And when a man on Earth pushes a button in any one of NASA's worldwide network of many track tracking stations, the S-55 will respond will transmit its information to Earth on 96 channels of telemetry. One minute is required to transmit all data. The data will be recorded on tape and shipped to the Data Reduction Center at Langley, where the tape will be fed into electronic computers that will transpose the signals and print the data on rolls of paper for study and analysis by science. And someday, a wave pattern on paper tape like this may mean the difference to a space traveler's life will help America along the road into space exploration. This is the objective of Project S-55.